It's my pleasure to do a brief uh, introduction to what happens in a clinical trial. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Daniel Claussen. I'm a neurologist at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm going to tell you kind of firsthand what, what can happen during a, a clinical trial. And this will be useful to you as you consider uh, your potential involvement or your loved one's potential involvement in a clinical trial. My hope is that at, at the end of this, some of these um, concepts that we talk about in a trial might be demystified and you'll feel a lot more comfortable uh, armed with some more knowledge about uh, these, these um, procedures and processes and give you some, uh, some, some um, ability to make decisions uh, for your involvement or your loved one's involvement into a trial. So to begin with, uh, let's, I, I think the most important thing that I tell my patients is to define the difference between a clinical trial and a therapy. And I think this is very difficult for many of us because sometimes we equate the um, word clinical trial with clinical therapeutic. And maybe that's because we sometimes think that there's um, you know, a, a cure or a treatment for a disease that's, that's going to be, you know, available if we join the trial. Maybe it's partly from desperation that we put our faith in things that, you know, the, that maybe we shouldn't put our faith in, or maybe it's because we've seen a movie where someone got a clinical uh, trial um, medication and they got better. But I think it's it's one of those very difficult things that um, unfortunately sometimes gets lost in this discussion. And the reality is that most clinical trials don't work. That is, most clinical trial therapies that we try uh, do not uh, pan out to be successful for their intended purpose. Purpose, and that's not a reason not to get involved. It's just a it's kind of a harsh reality of that what we're doing is research when we do a clinical trial and there's different types of trials and different types of um, options for patients. But I think ultimately the goal of being involved in a trial is to see if we can find a better way to treat, find a better way to diagnose, find a better way to prevent a disease. We don't get into trials to try and get therapy or to try and get treatment. And in at least the United States and probably all over the world, these trials happen in medical centers. Uh, it could be academic medical centers like where I practice. It could be um, private clinical trial centers. So there are a lot of private uh, companies now that, that kind of act as warehouses for, for clinical trials. And then there are clinical research uh, centers that are sometimes private or private as we say, that, that you might have a clinical trial. One of the big things that often patients come to see me uh, ask is they, they ask me, what's the new and latest hope for patients or what's the new and latest clinical trial? And it's certainly hard to keep track of, of all these things. I'm just ha happy that the MSA Coalition has uh, Dr. Wenig because he's uh, he, every time I listen to his update in MSA, I might learn something new about a new therapy or a new option that I was uh, unaware of. Um, but but you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. It's kind of a warehouse for what the current state is for what trials are recruiting and what they're trying to assess and where they're happening. Um, those aren't necessarily vetted by clinicians or by um, a person, uh, whether or not they're worthwhile to, to be involved in or whether they have a good scientific premise. It's just uh, kind of a warehouse for these. And there's a lot more regulations now, at least in the United States, about if you're doing a trial, you have to kind of put it on the clinicaltrials.gov and you got to update it and you got to make sure you report the results. But we're hopeful that the MSA Coalition can help you find trials. And so we have a, our own uh, work in progress where we're trying to develop a good communication system to, to, to help patients with trials. And I think it's also useful to talk to your clinician because they often uh, will be in the know uh, about what's what kind of trials are open. 
here's an example of, of clinicaltrials.gov. And this is a trial that used to be recruiting and now it's not, but um, it, it ended up not meeting its primary endpoint. End but I put it here um, to show you what you might find if you typed in MSA. So I'll take you quickly through what types of trials we have. Um, observational trials are ones where we follow patients uh, over time to understand how the disease changes or how markers of the disease might change. There's no therapeutic intervention for observational study, um, but they're very helpful for us because we're able to understand, say, how biomarkers work or how disease uh, symptoms are assessed, how those uh, assessments change. Uh, and they're very important to be involved in. The very first time a, a human will get medication, we call that a phase one study. Uh, and a phase two study is where we're trying to determine the clinical effect or the target effect of a, of a therapy. And a, a phase three uh, study is usually what we call a pivotal study where it's if I give this uh, therapy to a patient, does it work? Um, and then once a patient gets approved or or once a, clinic, a clinical trial is over, sometimes those roll over to what's called open label, where, where a patient is guaranteed to get the medicine and not a placebo. And typically, those are also done for safety and tolerability. But here are my kind of points that I'd like to encourage you uh, to consider if you're getting ready to be involved in a trial. The first one is know what you're getting into. And there's a lot of different uh, aspects to this, but Oftentimes we have energy or we have um, desire to get involved in a trial and we, we commit to things and then it's, you realize that, oh gosh, I don't really think that I can commit to this. And that happens sometimes. We really want patients to make sure they understand what they're getting involved in. So for instance, if you're having to go to the clinic every month for a, a treatment, but you realize that, gosh, you know, I don't think I can commit to that because my son's getting married or I'm going to go on a family vacation that I've always wanted to do, you know, those, those kind of important decisions must be taken into consideration uh, before you get involved in a trial. So look at this thing called the informed consent. So this is a document that's written uh, in lay language. It's not supposed to be scientifically complicated. You can read it. You should understand the schedule of what the trial is asking you to do. The, risk, the risks of the medication, how the medication is given, what type of things is going to happen. And, and at the end of it, you, 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 des you decide as a patient, is this something I want to do or is this something uh, that's not for me? And, and I think the informed consent is something that you can sit and read. You don't have to decide the day off. You can take it home. You can think about it. Uh, but it's really important, I, I would say, to read that in consent and know what you're getting involved in. The trial is generally made with what's called inclusion and exclusion criteria. And so for inclusion criteria, what the investigators are trying to do is to really define the characteristics of a person for that study. And so, for instance, in MSA, it may be we want to have patients that have MSA that can walk or that can ambulate independently because the investigator thinks that 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 MSA is such a diverse disease that they, they want to make sure if their drug works, they're looking at people that are at least at a similar baseline level. So, you know, I wouldn't, if, if the inclusion criteria doesn't uh, include um, aspects of your personal uh, journey, that's okay. And remember, it's a trial, it's not a therapy. And I think uh, it's useful just to read those inclusion criteria to see if it's the right trial for you. Then in exclusion criteria are things that a person may or may not have that, that uh, would potentially not benefit uh, from enrolling in the study. So the best example I could give is if I have a drug that um, may, may cause bleeding and I have a patient that has a history of problems with bleeding, I wouldn't want to give that, that patient that medication. And so we call that exclusion criteria. And so you'll have inclusion and exclusion criteria as part of a trial. Sometimes what we try and do in, in clinics is to what's called pre-serena patient. So we'll, we'll look at our clinical notes or our, our recollection of the clinical exam. And we'll, we'll see, gosh, does this patient 
fit what we're looking for. And if we think it is a chance, we'll, we'll call you and let you know that, Hey, we actually think this trial might work for you. Um, and, um, this is something that's very useful for, for our patients as we run these trials. So when you get to a clinical trial, you know, there's, it's important to know who, who the people are around you. I would say most of our patients love being involved in trials because they get to know our team and we love it because we get to know you and we build a very close relationship with, with our, our colleagues and, and our patients over the trial. The most important person for you is going to be the clinical coordinator. This is the person that's going to call you most of the time. They're going to know all about you. You're going to know all about them. They're sometimes on your speed dial. They're going to remind you about appointments. They're going to schedule things for you. They're going to help you manage any side effects that you may or may not have. Sometimes those coordinators are research nurses. Other times they're not. But most of the, most places like ours have a research nurse, someone who has some verbiage in uh, medical vernacular that they can kind of translate things for you or, or help manage the side effects. There'll be a clinician, usually a neurologist or cardiologist or uh, someone who's got a uh, medical doctorate. And there could be ancillary staff. So if you get an MRI, there'll be a technician or someone like that who's in the center with you. So what, what happens when you go to a trial? Well, a lot of times in MSA, we, we do MRIs or, or PET scans. So these are different ways that we image the brain. This is what an MRI looks like, at least one in our center. And so it's often uh, expected that a person's going to get an MRI maybe two or three times during the trial, and you would just lie in there, and there, you, your head would go in that coil, and you would uh, get some assessments of, of imaging. It's common that we might get um, a cognitive test or a test of your cognitive uh, abilities, so to speak. Uh, so we may ask you to write some things down on paper or do some memory tests or get you to um, uh, come up with a list of words or things like that, some way that we can assess how your brain's functioning. We might uh, do a medical exam. We might do a lumbar puncture. Uh, that's where we put a needle in your back to draw some cerebral spinal fluid. It might take some blood. Sometimes we'll take a skin biopsy and take some uh, tissue to look at under a microscope. But all those things that you go through really um, ultimately uh, are to test whether or not this therapy is beneficial or not. Um, and many patients ask me, like, what, what do I get from participating? And I think um, the most important thing I think you get from participating is, is being part of the bigger picture of trying to combat MSA. This, the therapies that you agree to participate in may not help you. They may not pan out, but ultimately your participation is going to help us understand MSA. It's going to help us help others help the future generations. It's a great way for you to be involved with your local clinic. I would say that most of our patients who do trials really appreciate the contact that they have with the team. They get to see us very frequently. We get to know them very well, much more than just a clinic visit. And I think that's really important. It's kind of fun to be involved in treatments. You know, sometimes you get a placebo or a therapy you don't know, but it's kind of interesting to see how a therapy works. Um, and I think being part of the team, the clinical team, as we try to discern whether or not these treatments are beneficial or not is also a big help. So what I would encourage you to do after this talk is, is to get involved. Um, if you're on an MSA coalition chat rooms or social uh, work led support groups, you guys can talk about trials and get involved. Um, I am a big fan of patient driven um, clinics. And those are that, what I mean by that is where you tell the clinical team what they need to do to provide better care. If they need to add a different service or if they need to add a different trial, you tell them what you want and they'll work with you to get that uh, sorted. And I think finally, stay in touch. Uh, we at the MSA Coalition would love to stay in touch with you to understand where we can help you in this journey, uh, especially when it comes to clinical trials. We try and work with, with, with companies. Uh, to, to help them um, 
find the best patients for their trials and, and coordinate some of these efforts. And so we want to stay in touch with you. So with that, I thank you for this uh, short um, review on clinical trials. I hope it's useful as you consider uh, the future and where you are. And I look forward to talking to you soon.